Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, webinar of the resource series, which is called the resource calling series, and it specifically will be on the buyer's guide to on-site renewable electricity and storage across Europe. And for this webinar, uh, we will have the pleasure uh, to listen to three great speakers. The first one will be um, Harald Overholm, the CEO of Allied Energy. Also, we'll have the pleasure to listen to Karol Gopczynski, Head of Climate and Energy at Inga Group, and Jerry Moons, Sustainable Development Leader for Decathlon. Very good. So, um, please allow me to um, pass my slide. Let me see. Um, let me check. Okay, perfect. So first, I would love to introduce you to the typical um, corporate sourcing journey of the different options available. So one of the options that we for corporates to explore um, actually contracted uh, green types and also maybe purchase a uh, renewable energy certificate, so guarantees of origins. And there are companies that they prefer more ambitious strategies meaning um, forward purchase agreements and also maximizing on-site generation in their facilities. So as you can see here in the graph at the right, we can see the uh, trajectory of the capacities for PPAs and also for commercial and industrial installations on-site in Europe. So these are annual installations. And as you can see uh, for PPAs in Europe that started around 2016, and now in 2020, we already see capacity deployments of about 4 gigawatts. And for uh, the on-site generation, uh, for the next slide, please. For on-site generation, we can see that um, actually for uh, 2020, we can see the capacity that has been doubled of about 8 gigawatts. And in total, the cumulative capacity was about 60 gigawatts. And we are seeing forecasts for 2030 of about 380 gigawatts of renewable capacity for on-site only. So this slide shows the um, highest visibility of the renewable commitments are possible for different strategies. And as you can see, the uh, one on the top is specifically on maximizing on-site generation of renewables on their facilities and how that can be done. So actually, we can think about uh, different methods, different approaches that can be, for instance, self-owned on-site and also through leasing models, on-site PPAs, or even uh, nearby the facilities leveraging private wires PPAs. In the next slides, the speakers will present uh, these models more in depth, their own specific examples. And as we can see uh, in the next slide, We have produced a, a report, a resource report, specifically on on-site renewable generation. And the speakers of today have contributed to this report. And now I'll present you the added value from on-site renewable generation. And that, for instance, can be to optimize the use space of your own facilities, meaning the um, carports and also the rooftops of the warehouses, for example. Another added value can be a better use of the grid, that lowering the grid losses and also to reduce the need for grid expansion. So by reducing the needs to deploy more transmission and distribution lines, actually ultimately uh, the cost for consumers that would be also reduced. So that's the, another advantage. The third one is actually to help against the financial risks. That means reducing a consumer's electricity bills by decreasing the exposure to fossil fuel price volatility. Then also mobilizing investments in renewable electricity sector, meaning that actually the corporates, they would be financing, deploying new renewable energy capacities, and that would be to contributing actively to the energy transition by deploying more renewable energy plants. 
And the fourth one, also very important, is that actually these companies, they can show leadership in contributing towards clean and sustainable societies by installing these renewable energy plants on their facilities or around them. Very good. So after this introduction, we will uh, listen to Karol Gopczynski, head of the Inca Group. Oh, okay. Um, before that, I would like to uh, introduce you to the contents of the report of research that we have developed. And this includes, for example, sorry, first slide. Perfect. This report uh, reveals the potential of on-site renewable electricity generation in Europe for the different member states. And also uh, we can see, um, perfect. We identify the challenges and the barriers faced by the industrial and commercial energy consumers. It showcases measures to unlock the added value and potential of on-site renewable generation and storage. Like, the common on-site business models for the industrial and commercial facilities, including, for instance, installing, as mentioned, um, solar PV plants on the rooftops or the carports or nearby the facilities via direct block. And the last bit, it provides a European regulatory framework that is fit for the future for the commercial and industrial actors. Now, yes, I'll leave you with Karol Kopczynski, Head of the Climate and Energy Group at Inca Group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mers, for the introduction and uh, showing the interesting content. Uh, so, uh, Inca Group is uh, one of the companies working on the IKEA brand, uh, representing 90% of the uh, sales and uh, bringing IKEA on to the people on 32 markets. And uh, uh, if I can ask for the next slide. Uh, so uh, renewable energy is a very important part of the IKEA climate positive commitment and it uh, will play a significant role when it comes to reducing the uh, footprint across the value chain. And on the next slide, uh, so we know that climate change is impacting many people's uh, lives and it will impact even more people's lives uh, into the future if we don't start to act now. And uh, as a big uh, global brand, IKEA has responsibility uh, to act and take more climate action, as well as opportunity to uh, be even more relevant for the customers who want to live within the limits of the planet. On the next slide. Uh, Yeah, uh, I, and IKEA vision is to create better everyday life for the many people. And we know that the climate change is the biggest threat when it comes to impacting the people everyday lives across the world. Next one, please. And we know that our customers and coworkers are already asking us to act even more and uh, be much more bold when it comes to actions and collaborate with others to create net zero economy. Next one. And uh, that's why uh, IKEA has a commitment to become climate positive by 2030. Uh, and to become climate positive by 2030, on the next slide, we can see the total IKEA value chain where emission, where we are considering emissions from the supply chain, meeting the customers, and product use at home. And energy is used within the different parts of the supply chain when it comes to material processing, production, transportation, using energy use within the uh, stores and distribution centers, energy use for the customer travel and deliveries, as well as energy used in people's homes to power LED lighting provided by IKEA. And to become climate positive, on the next slide, we can see the model when we said, if we don't take any actions we and continue business as usual, the emissions will keep increasing. And to be able to reduce more greenhouse gas emissions than IKEA value chain emits, we first of all need to focus on drastic reduction of emissions. Second area, it's about carbon removal within the uh, 
company value chain. And the third area, it's about going beyond and enabling a reduction of the footprint within the society. And here, one of the examples is offering home solar uh, to our customers uh, across the markets where we operate. Yeah, and on the next slide. Uh, and we can see that there are three main areas to drastically reduce emissions. And one of them is connected to energy, 100% uh, renewable energy use in an efficient way. And when we go further, uh, we, you can see that Inca Group consists of three parts, like IKEA Retail, Inca Centers, and Inca Investments. And today we have 30, uh, 388 stores in 32 markets and 40 meeting places which are located usually next to the uh, IKEA stores plus Inca investments. And on the next slide, you can, uh, you can see the total footprint of uh, Inca Group considering the, all the products which are being offered to our customers plus our operations. Yeah, next one. Uh, Inca Investments uh, invested in renewable energy to be able to generate more renewable energy that we consume by 2020. And uh, uh, can you click this uh, four times? Uh, so uh, we already invested 2.5 billion euro in uh, off-site and on-site renewable energy generation uh, to be able to generate more renewable energy that we consume. And we own 547 wind turbines across many markets in the uh, European Union and Canada and the US. And currently we are focusing on uh, China and Russia, where we don't own the big uh, offsite investments to be able to consume renewable electricity. We own two solar farms uh, and uh, we have uh, nine, 935,000 solar modules covering the uh, IKEA buildings and some of the parking uh, lots. Yeah, on the next one. Uh, so when it comes to our emissions connected to energy use in operations, we said by 2030, we need to reduce emissions by 80%. And to do it, we need to focus on the renewable electricity consumption. And on the next slide, you can see that our commitment is to secure 100% renewable electricity consumption by 2025. Uh, today we are uh, consuming already renewable electricity in majority of the markets and the big focus now is mainly uh, Russia and, and China and then Australia, yeah, India and Japan. But these two markets, Russia and China, are the where we have the largest consumption among these markets and that's where our focus is today. Next one. And it's not only about electricity, it's about heating and cooling. And that's why we are working towards uh, securing 100% renewable heating and cooling in all the buildings and uh, uh, remaining uh, electrifying and using heat pumps, ground source heat pumps and uh, air source heat pumps. And the third element, it's about energy efficiency. And uh, this is what we can see on the next slide. We are focusing on improving energy efficiency across operations because, of course, the cleanest and cheapest energies we never use. And that's why uh, we support the EU new Fit for 55% uh, package where existing climate and energy regulations are being reviewed to increase the ambition when it comes to renewable energy and energy efficiency in the buildings. Uh, to be in line with uh, the 2030 target. Mm -hmm. And when we go to the next one, when it comes to renewable electricity consumption, we have three primary ways. Uh, first choice is to secure on-site generation of renewable electricity, then investing off-site and uh, generating off-site renewable electricity and connect to our consumption. And the third one is the purchase of renewable electricity attributes from other uh, generators of renewable electricity on the market. And these are the three primary ways. Uh, when it comes to minimum and leadership criteria, we're looking as well into the 24-7 uh, renewable electricity consumption when we just uh, uh, finalizing the pilot uh, in Europe 
uh, to combine our uh, consumption in some of the stores with uh, wind farm. Arms in Finland. And can we go to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. Do you hear me? Just want to check because I see I have some connection issues. Yeah. So today I would like to present you two uh, examples. Uh, one uh, is from the IKEA US. And when we go to the next slide, you can see the exactly how it works. Within the store, uh, we have the PV panels on the roofs and carports, uh, and we are able to generate more renewable electricity that is being consumed on site. And uh, in the real time, when, whenever we are not able to consume the generated renewable electricity, it's sold to the, uh, to the grid. And uh, the second example, which I would like to present, is uh, from uh, IKEA Australia. And you can see on the uh, next slide, it's uh, located in Adelaide, where we are not only uh, generating solar panels on the rooftop and carport, but as well combining the generation with battery storage and digital solution. And here, through combining these three elements, we are able to be much more flexible when it comes to uh, providing electricity to the grid and consume it first. And But then when it comes to excess electricity, we can either store it in the batteries or you can inject it into uh, the grid. And this is thanks to the battery storage and the digital solution. So whenever there is a peak when it comes to con uh, consumption of electricity in the grid, then we can uh, provide additional electricity and then the off, during off-peak hours, we can uh, load the, the batteries. And this project is a great example of collaboration between the grid owner and the multiple solutions providers when we collaborate to create this uh, holistic uh, concept, which is helping not only us to reach the targets, but as well to enable the grid to be more resilient. And uh, yeah, and uh, I would like to close with the last slide and uh, looking forward to the discussion later on and hand over to Yuri from the Decathlon. Thank you, Carol, for the insights of uh, Inca Group. Um, I'm Yuri from Decathlon, um, and I want to present uh, you a little bit the strategy from the next slide uh, of Decathlon. The reason that we exist today is to be useful to the people and to their planet. That's our main ambition within Decathlon as a sporting brand. Uh, and uh, to present myself, I'm the sustainable development leader for Belgium, um, where I'm leading the topic to become neutral in 2050 for Decathlon. But also my main responsibility is to get the renewable energy uh, targeted for 2026 done by the countries um, because within Decathlon we are working on a decentralized uh, strategy because we want to source uh, the, the renewable energy as local as possible and want to give autonomy to every country to decide and to work on their proper strategy within the country potential. And uh, for us, we, we like I did, I think Inca Group do, um, are working on three main uh, re ways is the, the on-site solar uh, by uh, sending to the grid or auto consumption is our main priority um, and we can add it to that the power purchase agreement for off-site and everything what is green electricity supply or unbundled uh, guarantees of origin or also something that can be uh, done by uh, the countries within their strategy to become 100% renewable uh, the main uh, difficulties or uh, barriers that we face today is that Decathlon is uh, representing 60 markets with 1,700 stores uh, and, and warehouses, and 60% of them are in rental. So we need to uh, face with landlords that have the electricity contract. Um, in the 40% of property sites, we can easily go for our own um, strategy and work for the on-site 
solar or on-site wind options uh, where we can. But uh, the main way that we want to do is to maximize the, the roof and the parking space that we have within property sites and within rental sites. So we want to implement the landlords within our strategy. Um, the majority of our installations are third-party investments. So hardly uh, different than Inca Group is investing there himself. We are doing it by on-site PPA models or leasing models, depending on what the, what we can do locally, what the country uh, barriers are, and where we can face a third-party investment. We want to we want to try and do and to do this. And a main uh, way to to achieve our target is to involve landlords in the beginning of the process and to before we go to rent uh, a certain area. We want to de open the discussion about uh, renewable energy. We want to open up the on-site potential and discuss with them if there is any option and if they are not interested that we as Decathlon can become the owner of the, the, the roof so that we or the parking lot where we can uh, at that moment do an on-site investment uh, for solar panels. And uh, I want to, to have two uh, Two sites that we that we have uh, have done realized, uh, where we had a small store of 2,000 square meter on a retail site of six stores, where we uh, convinced the landlord to uh, to work together with a third party investment, um, where the landlord gets a roof rent um, for for his roof, and we can have a competitive energy price within a PPA model, um, where we can uh, have at that moment on-site solar. Uh, so that's a good thing. And the second point that, that was interesting uh, by the landlord is that he challenged us and the third party uh, to have also battery storage and to maximize really the, the space of, of, the, of the roof that there was, the potential, maximize the potential to have a battery um, for the common areas and the, the alimentation of the current areas where we can, he wants to go off grid um, with this installation and that's something uh, and a good example where we see that landlords sometimes are even more advanced than, than we are and are really thinking together with us to achieve uh, our, our renewable energy target and they want to go further than we go, so that's uh, already a good sign. Um, for us, it's still difficult with, within a lot of countries to, to get that landlords convinced that there is also a business case within them um, and, and for them. Uh, but this uh, shows us that there is still potential and that we are on the good uh, good way uh, to achieve it. And the second, uh, some, something that we did was an interaction with, uh, with local customers where we had a, a carport system, um, already uh, a, a store where we had solar panels on the roof and there was still potential for the carport uh, on the parking lot. Um, and we we looked into the citizens that uh, that are lived around um, if they were interested at that moment within energy uh, or renewable energy coming from solar panels. Um, and we we co-invested the, the citizens co-invested within the installation. We gave away our parking lot and we uh, became within the energy community one of the uh, we we take ten percent out of uh, out of the consumption there and all the rest is coming for the energy community. So there are a lot of people that are benefiting from these installations that are living nearby. Um, and it's also uh, done by a solar as a service model where we in implemented a supplier that was interesting to develop this case that wanted to work also with local customers um, and with the Decathlon customers. So for us, there was a win. Um, we have more uh, maximized our, our parking lot um, by the solar panels. So for us, there is an interest we can have uh, a slightly uh, um, consumption out of it, and also we can have uh, together with the with the with the local customer have a local need um, and connect the suppliers and the customers together to decentralize a little bit the energy and work and see if there is potential to to work on a smaller scale um, for renewable energy uh, and optimizing for us also uh, all the land that we have. Um, and that's something that we are looking now to, to deploy in, in several uh, countries if there is any potential to do it and if it's uh, a benefit for, for us and for our customers um, so that we can a little bit go beyond the, the implementation of our proper uh, on-site on solar systems.
So that's basically it for Decathlon, and I want to hand over to Harold. Thank you so much, Jory, for that uh, for that account, and thanks also to uh, Carol, of course, and IKEA for for talking about that. I'm going to build on actually what Jory has been talking about with the um, with the solar as a service model. Um, I represent a light energy. Let me get my slides in order here. Uh, see if we can get the first one. There you go. Um, and a light is a uh, we're, we're the supplier so in this webinar we represent the supply side we do commercial and industrial rooftops uh, across europe and we do it as power purchase agreements uh, or solar as a service and this is really the core of who we are we uh, set up the company uh, eight years ago i'm i'm the ceo and founder and we had a simple vision eight years ago of um, leading the market in europe for subsidy free solar and and you know there's only one way that solar can be subsidy free. It's when someone else than the government pays for it. And so that's what a PPA is about. It's about helping power users to pay for solar in order to build more solar. And we were really inspired by the U.S. market where this had happened at a large scale, and it's still happening in the U.S. at at an even larger scale. So um, yeah, and we became kind of pioneers in this. We we did the first. I mean, I think we did among the first rooftop PPAs in uh, ever in Europe in 2015, and we did them in Sweden, which is a very dark country. So uh, you can imagine uh, that it was a little bit of a challenge. But those were pilots, and and the market has scaled very rapidly since. So at the time, we were doing things like 50 kilowatts. Now we're doing maybe one and a half megawatt rooftops. Um, we're also done the the largest solar park in Sweden two times actually, and both like as PPA power purchase agreements with with large corporates. Um, and a good example of this was that we just uh, released a project yesterday with Kingspan. Uh, if you haven't heard of Kingspan, it's one of the largest construction um, materials companies in the world. It's an early RE hundred member, um, a net zero company, already reached net zero energy actually. Uh, highly sustainable. So they are opening a new factory in, in Sweden. And so we're building 1.3 megawatts of, of solar on that rooftop. We're selling the power back to Kingspan. So the fact that Kingspan will be paying for the power over the long term helps us to uh, to build the project. And of course, Kingspan will save money on the power uh, and they will um, achieve their, keep achieving their SDG and net zero goals. So that's how most power purchase agreements look like. Um, what more to say about us? Well, I mean, the one, one thing I'm going to add is that we are, of course, in the middle of a market. That's that's and just to go back all the way to the beginning to what Mercy said when she she showed you the numbers about what's happening with commercial and industrial solar in Europe. Um, it's a very very rapidly expanding market. So I told you we did the first PPAs uh, on on rooftops in 2015. Uh, and these days we have a pipeline ourselves of about 1.5 gigawatts of, of rooftop PPAs. So um, the, the 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 shift of interest in this from from corporate customers has been astonishing over the last five years. Uh, and it's the mix, as always, of sustainability goals, Agenda 2030 uh, being much more sharp, um, and interest in saving money on power, basically. Um, good, I'm gonna move on to my next slide and just guide you through the, what I feel is the most important topic here, which is, so in the end, what is actually holding this market back? Um, <clears throat> I think we all agree that, that solar is important. We all know the potential for rooftop solar in Europe. It's vast, it's enormous. I mean, we could power so much of our needs by just simply using rooftops and on-site installations in the future. Um, and of course, as, as Mercy showed you, this market is growing fast, but but I think anyone who's been in it for a while would also agree that, you know, let's look at why it's not growing faster because there's so much left to be done. Being a supplier here, um, I spend my days talking to commercial and industrial customers who are thinking about rooftops. So. We talk to hundreds of, of large power users every year um, about on-site installations. 
um, maybe even thousands these days actually. And so what I'm going to tell you on this slide is just what we pick up along the lines of what those people are telling us. And it's not, it doesn't really matter if, if they end up becoming our customers or not, or if they pick um, a PPA business model or not. This is kind of what we hear from everyone who is out in the market thinking about this. So the first big, uh, the first big headline here is that the general sense of hassle with on-site, if you were to ask anyone, I think, 99% of those who've been looking at doing some kind of on-site rooftop solar installation, what, what held them back? What was difficult? They would just say, you look, there was just so much hassle going on. And I think that hassle is, you know, first of all, it's just all the decisions you have to make in, in every dimension from technical to environmental to financial, etc. It's all the stakeholders that, that you'll end up interacting with. Um, when you do on-site, there might be a, a local site manager, there might be a real estate owner or, or, or lease, um, lease company. Uh, you might have all kinds of consultants. You have headquarters, perhaps, with their own requirements. It's, uh, it's, it's just a, a quagmire of um, stakeholders. And then add to that the fact that today, when people consider on-site solar, they usually start thinking, well, hey, you know, this is a really fast moving area, actually. It's not just about solar, it's about the whole energy solution. And that's just what Carol was telling you about with, uh, with the IKEA installations. Then people go, wait, you know, <clears throat> is that something we have to have a comprehensive plan for? Do we have to understand battery storage and uh, digital optimization and uh, EV charging and solar at the same time? Can we, or can we do it uh, one by one? Well, you know, how are we going to figure that out? And the second headline here that just comes with the hassle, uh, and this is something that's really changed in the market over the last five years, is that I think the hassle is just getting uh, more difficult because of the fact that rooftop solar is becoming more important. And what I mean by that is that five years ago, a lot of companies would come to us and talk about rooftop solar, being interested in maybe a pilot installation, maybe something that was a little bit visible, but small, you know, maybe frankly, just for the image uh, picture to put on the annual report with the headquarters with the small solar panels. And that's fine, you know, we didn't, we don't judge. <laughs> but, but what we can tell today is that there's a different ballgame. So people have realized, and this is something that the US market realized a long time ago, that it's not about the solar panels, it's about the solar power. You know? So you do something because you want a lot of solar power, and you want it over a long time, and you want it to be very, very predictable. Um, and that suddenly means that there's even more sharpness to the analysis you have to make. And in case you doubt me in terms of what hassle actually means when you when you start looking at on-site uh, rooftop, I just tried to make this very schematic overview on the right-hand side here. And um, I'm just going to say, for us, so we're a professional owner of solar assets. So when we do a power purchase agreement, we, we sell power to the client, but we have the technical know-how, we, we build the asset, we manage the asset, we have the financing to own it. So whatever goes on with, with, this, uh, with this installation, it's end up being our headache. And when we look at solar assets, these are all the topics that we look at. So it's not just about picking the panels, it's about a whole lot of other things. Um, that's what I mean by hassle. Now, you know, having said all those things, uh, not, not having uh, raised perhaps the enthusiasm here for, for on-site solar. Uh, what is my recommendation? Well, my simple recommendation is, you know, stop it. Like, don't, you know, don't think about this. Don't think about the hassle. Um, I'm gonna move to the next slide to explain what I mean. Because the, this is the one reason why the idea of solar as a service was created. Um, solar power purchase agreements. It doesn't matter if it's PPA or not, just any way of, turning solar into a service was created um, in 2005 in the US by a guy called Jigar Shaw and a company called Sun Edison. And Jigar, who is someone who's been, uh, been, been uh, a role model for us setting up this company, Jigar had one single uh, goal and purpose with doing that. It was to remove the hassle from the market, make it super, super easy and fast for corporate customers to get solar. So we can learn a bit from the US market in terms of what this has meant, because I think this is not 
the US market, the, the European market is growing fast and we're all exploring what this means and, and what subsidy free solar means. I think what we can learn from the Americans is the fact that solar as a service was created in order to remove all the hassle, but you can only remove all the hassle in one way, and that's by pushing all the risks onto the supplier. So this is really the core of the business model. It's to for you as a client, or for anyone who is a client who's looking to have a solar panel on the rooftop, just realize that the way to get rid of the hassle is to trust or make sure that you have the kind of agreement, a PPA agreement, that pushes risk onto the supplier. Because the more risk you push onto the supplier, the less you have to care about it, and the less you have to spend time actually evaluating it. And when you learn from some of the really big US stories, so I like, for example, the, uh, the case study of Walmart. So Walmart has about 150 megawatts of on-site rooftop in the US uh, through power purchase agreements with um, a, a number, a few different top suppliers in, in the US. And Walmart went as far as when they did the tendering for these PPAs, they actually went as far as just giving simply the GPS coordinates for the rooftops, nothing else. So just the GPS coordinates. So they would not accept dealing with any hassle themselves, except for finding those GPS coordinates, which I hopefully you'll be able to find in your information system. You can find the GPS coordinates for, for the, uh, the sites that you use. But aside from that hassle, they did nothing. Uh, no evaluations, no particular analysis, nothing. They just provided these GPS coordinates to suppliers and said, look, have a look at these rooftops. You know, use whatever information is out there and then tell us what price per kilowatt hour you can deliver at. And then came the phase in which Walmart actually did some work. And I think this is the, the, this is the kind of work that anyone who's looking at rooftop solar will have to do by themselves, is to try to assess the, the saving. When you know the kilowatt hour price of putting solar on your roof and you have your own current kilowatt hour price from buying power from, from the grid, you can calculate the saving. And the best way to do that is usually to calculate the total net present value of all the savings across the whole PPA. So you, you just take all those 15 years or 20 years, whatever it is, and you, you create a net present value of, of the whole thing. And you get a simple number. And then, then Walmart just had that number per site. And they would just pick all the sites that had a net present value over a certain level and they would go to the supplier and say look you know go ahead please build us whatever you had planned to build and this is where you come down to the the fourth bullet here uh, another learning from the u.s market because at this point you might be saying but look i mean this sounds a bit crazy you don't want to hand over responsibility to someone else to just do whatever they want with your rooftop and you have done nothing no analysis whatsoever that doesn't work does it no so what what is usually done in the u.s market is that you write a PPA, but the PPA has a first six month grace period during which suddenly the supplier has to do the work. They have to present you with exactly how this is going to be done, the analysis, etc. And of course, both you and the supplier have the right to step away from that contract if for some reason it doesn't work. And of course, the PPA should specify you know, that, that there should be a clear analysis done of the rooftop, etc. But looking at it from the side of the supplier, this is okay because this is the, the suppliers know what they're doing. They are supposed to, now that they know that you've signed the PPA, even though there's a grace period, you have signed it, they are willing to do this work and they will do the work for you and you will not have to hire a consultant to do it. You shouldn't basically have to deal with the hassle. So you've come all this way, all the way to the end of, or the start of the project, um, and you have not dealt with hassle. Now, that is how we can put serious speed into this market. Because at the point when you realize that, okay, this is how rooftop projects could actually work, then the final insight from the US market is that, look, if this is how it works, then it's actually more efficient to do this for a large number of rooftops or for perhaps every rooftop that you have than only for one. Because the more rooftops you do it for, the more significant the amount of economical value will be for the suppliers. So you'll get more attention and more focus from the suppliers and they'll be willing to take even more risk uh, from your own organization. 
because the NPV of your savings is going to be significantly larger. So this suddenly ends up being kind of a hero story on, on, on top corporate level. And you get whatever mandate you need to push it through. So that's why you've seen over time in the US market how these enormous uh, tenders have, have taken place. I mean, Whole Foods have, have done um, rooftop PPAs for all of their stores. Uh, Walmart, the same thing. Uh, companies like Intel have done uh, coordinated PPA rollouts for, for every uh, industrial rooftop that they have. Because once you realize that there's a way around the hassle, it actually just makes sense to get it done. Uh, and, and when we're at that point, I think we've put some new speed into the market. We've just increased that pace of deployment that is crucial for hitting the targets of this market, for hitting the targets of Agenda 2030. Because SDG 7, which is the SDG that asks for more renewable energy, so SDG 7.2, it's the, the actual SDG target that tells us to put more renewable energy into the grid. It is behind schedule, not only elsewhere in the world, but in Europe, it's behind schedule. So this is not just about your company, it's not just about our company or the suppliers for that matter, it is about the SDGs and cracking the code to getting acceleration into the rooftop market. Right, that would be enough for me and hopefully some questions. Over to you, Mercy. Thank you very much, Harold. Also, thank you very much, Yeri and Carol. Uh, these uh, were super informative presentations and how I hope that the audience was uh, listening uh, very cautiously. And now what I would love to do is to start uh, the round of the Q&A. So I would love to um, read the questions coming from the audience. So please uh, just type, I guess at this at your right, any questions that you may have, and I will pass them on to the speakers. Perfect. So as the questions um, I, I start arriving, I actually would love to start with uh, one of the questions that I had in mind when I was listening to the presentation of Yeri from the Calder. So you mentioned, Yuri, that uh, your model, the, the model that uh, the Decathlon follows, is more focused on uh, PPA models and also on leasings. And for that, you really need to deal, to have interactions, to have conversations with the landlords. So we know that there are some technical um, and regulatory hurdles. There are some barriers on the way. But actually, there are some challenges also for the landlords and also for the rental sites. So could you please enlighten us a little bit more on that direction? Uh, of course, thanks for the question. Um, yes, for us, it's not only the sort of technical and administrative barriers is uh, for everyone and everyone is facing that. Um, but for us, the, the journey starts within the internal um, conviction and to get real estate at the same line as, as uh, sustainable development goals um, and for us so we need to convince first our real estate uh, people that are in direct contact with the landlords um, to get uh, re green lease contracts uh, where we can integrate um, solar panels or the on-site uh, systems to get our renewable energy and that's a uh, that we that's something that we see that is not common in a lot of countries um, so that's an implementation that we need to have within all landlords that it's become common that green lease uh, contracts are are more common in in the US and that on site and the potential that is that is for the moment on site uh, needs to be covered uh, so that we can uh, get our target uh, and achieve our target and also that the landlords see the benefit of it um, to use their their roof that uh, that is built for it uh, and cover it by uh, by solar installations. I see. Very good. Very clear. And picking up how actually can we can combine uh, the deployment of solar with the storage, uh, we have one question for Harold. So how do you integrate storage in your solar as a service offer? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> it's it's, it's <laughs> actually it's of course it's super uh, complex to some extent because over time i think storage is going to generate a lot of values for corporate customers but it's going to be significantly more dynamic values than solar i mean solar is very straightforward you deliver power and you pay for the power 
And then, of course, with storage, we can do about five or six different things. So it ends up being complex, but complex doesn't mean impossible. So it's already something we're seeing happening in the US. We see just simple corporate contracts for buying the services, the reliability services of, of storage. Um, and that is going to happen. We, we're, we're on the level right now where we're trying out models, financial models for that uh, in Europe. And we haven't quite made them work yet. So we, uh, uh, we, I mean, in the sense that we haven't made them, taken them to a point where they make money for both us and, and, and the client in a, in a reliable way. But it's fairly close. So that's going to happen very soon. The other thing I want to say about that, which I think is an important point, uh, is that typically you don't have to optimize the solar asset for storage. So in almost all cases, you can basically go ahead today, build the solar asset, uh, and then you know just wait for whatever opportunities to do storage that comes up. There might be a few exceptions to this rule, uh, but it, as a general point, solar is so standardized and it's just so simple to, to implement that we would recommend against turning it into one big complex project and, and actually there's a high likelihood that you're going to be able to deploy quickly if you break it up to to several different uh, projects very good thanks and also uh, related to this last point on breaking down on smaller projects uh, you have pointed to the hero story so that is for the higher management for the companies instead of just focusing, for instance, on one installation to become more ambitious and to aim for, I don't know, three, four, five more installations, more warehouses uh, to cover them with solar, for example. And for that, uh, we have one specific questions is whether do you use the same PPA agreement to cover multiple sites? How does it work? Yeah, so yeah, good. I mean, these are technical questions, but but very good ones. Um, you, the preferred way to would be to have one simple PPA template and just uh, switch out the numbers. Uh, now, the only thing that's working against that in Europe would be that different countries will have a bit of, you know, there, there are some differences in what kind of PPAs you can sign. And actually, in some countries in Europe, you can still not sign rooftop PPAs, and then you can sign a lease instead, which is ultimately ends up working almost exactly the same way, but the contract's gonna look a little bit different. So if you do this in a cross country way in Europe today, then you will end up, but I think you can you can make that very clear in the RFP that you can say like, look, these are the 80% of the contract that's gonna look the same across all, all places. Now these are the 20% that's gonna be a little different in Poland and Germany. So it can still be very standardized. Um, in the US, it, it has been done with one single contract and then you just, um, you basically have appendices with, with, for the different sites with different kilowatt hour prices. And that's of course, a very, very neat way to do it. Lovely, thanks Harald. And uh, we have one question specifically uh, for Carol. And that, I guess, is uh, related to the model that you have showcased uh, for Australia, where also you discuss how you integrate storage into uh, their strategy. And that is how much do you incorporate the peak shaving and also the load balancing into your energy strategy? So how that relates to the building management system, meaning how do you integrate this storage? in your mm -hmm. business model and how that helped IKEA, but also on the grid. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a very good question. And I think when uh, we look from the batteries perspective, you need to look into a couple of different revenue streams to optimize it and to have a good business model. And one part is definitely the peak shaving and uh, reducing the capacity that you, are, you're, you need from the grid. So this is definitely one of the positions which is going into the business case. The second one is, is there any local regulation as well, which is enabling you to benefit as well from owning the storage? So if you are uh, providing the flexibility to the grid through your storage, for example, is there local regulations which are uh, increasing your additional revenue streams connected to that one? And I think this is the where we see the storage is developing uh, quite well. It's always this combination of these two, 
plus there could be the third level which is much more connected to resilience of the grid and how stable is the grid so within some of the markets where there is a and uh, there are shortages when it comes to electricity then the resilience part is coming as a, as a third parameter in a case of uh, australia i think what was really important is as well the collaboration with the grid owner a local grid owner with whom the project is being developed as well to uh, to provide this flexibility as well to the grid and support the local grid uh, which is important part of the business case lovely thanks thanks carol and now I would love to bring up uh, one of the models that actually is uh, rather new and extremely important because it's about bringing the society, the communities into the corporate strategies. And this model has been presented by Yori, by Decathlon, and is uh, the concept of the energy community. So Yori, you mentioned that uh, you are receiving like co-investments uh, from the citizens. And this is the model that actually has been welcomed by the uh, European Commission to bring the citizens into the energy transition. Could you please elaborate a little bit further on this specific model? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so what we do, uh, like I explained, we always work with the third party investment and we asked to them um, to not uh, invest by, by banks, but uh, rather go, go for a uh, uh, co-investment by citizens and specifically um, if there is an, uh, an option to do it uh, with, with Decathlon customers. Um, so what we did uh, was send it out uh, to all our customers that are living nearby um, the, the potential to, to invest within solar panels that will come. Um, and we opened up uh, to, 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 to invest uh, within starting of 500 euros um, for, for share. Um, until the maximum size uh, of, of the investment. And we saw within two weeks that uh, everything was uh, sold out and the investment was uh, reached. And so that's something that we did now already uh, in, I, if I'm not wrong, already 10 sites. Um, and that's a, uh, something that we are looking forward and uh, using now as a, as a way to, to invest uh, our, our solar panels uh, and not by investment by banks. Uh, Lovely, thanks. And uh, we have one question that I guess is for Harald, but anyone feel free to jump in. So actually that is translated to the, what is the minimum uh, range of the area to have available on-site fields? You have mentioned Harald that you already have made some projects of about certain kilowatts, uh, but also I've written down one up to 1.5 megawatts, right? So what is like the minimum like a area uh, to actually have available on-site deals? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to tell you, uh, it's very small. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, the, the smallest project we've ever done was 20 kilowatts. Um, mm. And I don't know if you can do the math here, but I think 20 kilowatts would end up being something like a hundred, few hundred square meters. Is that, yeah, I, I might be wrong, but I think, not even a few, not even a few hundred square meters, mm -hmm. less than that. Maybe someone is faster than me here in doing the cat, doing the math. It's very small. Um, so that works. I mean, the question is just if you find a supplier who's willing to go through the process of working with you in order to do that. It's it's arguably it's easier um, if you're doing a big rollout and then one of the rooftops is very small. Then I think that's fine. You know, people would want to throw that in. Uh, and then for yourself, it might be a question if you. Are you actually going to save money on that one? Maybe not, so that you might have a negative net present value of your savings. But you know, maybe that's okay because you think it's an important uh, symbolic action or something. Mm -hmm. So I feel a lot of times with clients, we end up having conversations where we look at two or three really big things, and then we talk to them about throwing in something small on the side, and that that might be really good because in the end, that's how you um, build out the maximum capacity. So to summarize, there's no rules here. You know, you can, let, you, we can get it all done, but let's spend our time on the big stuff first, uh, probably best. I can just add uh, to this one that 
we see that today majority of the installation in Europe are very much optimized around self-consumption in real time. So you look on your profile on consumption within the building to minimize how much electricity you, you inject into the grid. Uh, and I think that's one of the opportunities that we still have with the with the space and what we see within among other companies as well to increase uh, the installations on site if there are the regulations which are enabling for a non-utility company to e in easy way to uh, to sign the contract of selling the electricity to the grid and uh, or different flexibility mechanisms and i think that's uh, maybe where we see it's growing and then developing is uh, very much connected to this easy access to the grid. If it's uh, restricted, then we see majority of the installations are limited to the, what you can consume in real time within your building. Lovely. Thank you, Harald, and also thank you, Carol. And now we have uh, five minutes left, and I would love to start closing this webinar. And before doing so, I also would like to remind the audience that the resource and um, Harald, Yeri and Carol, they have been working on a resource report on on-site renewable energy generation and storage that you can find in our website, where you will see all these examples and more. And to link up, I would love to say that also in this report, we provide like an overview of what are the, like the, the best or the uh, fit for the future regulatory environment for these models to thrive and uh, before closing up i would love to have like one line from each of the speakers to see so at the beginning of the presentation we have seen like a steady growth of on-site installations but of course this growth can be steeper so what do you think in your opinion that is that needs to change in europe for actually see this market grow like faster mm. yeah i can start i think the first part it's about unification of permitting procedures i think the permitting procedures can be so different even between the different regions and uh, within the country which makes the process very long and i think especially for the uh, smaller size companies it, it is uh, very difficult sometimes to go through them uh, through the process the the second one is uh, again this uh, part of the instruments uh, which are encouraging the support to the grid i think this is uh, whenever we will see these instruments uh, more widely adopted i think we'll see my, much higher much more projects uh, which are increasing on-site generation as well as battery storage very good I, I can add to that that um, like Harold said before uh, that we can have in all the European countries already uh, a third party PPA investment would be that would be great that we can unify that and that for us we can multiply uh, what we did in one country to other countries easily uh, and that we don't need to adapt the PPA model uh, but we can use it um, all through the, through Europe um, and also secondly that we can have uh, that that, that auto consumption. Um, that we can can cover the, the consumption that we have a little bit like Carol explained 24/7 um, that we can reach out to that uh, and that we don't need to be obliged to to have injection um, on, on certain on certain European countries. Lovely, thanks. Yeah, I mean, all all very good suggestions. And if I can just take a step further back, you would just say it's it's so interesting to note that it's all about companies making decisions at this point. I mean, we grew up in Europe with, with the solar rollout that was much more about governments making decisions about feed-in tariffs, et cetera. But that time is past. And, and what's going to drive companies use about 70% of all power in society. So they are the ones, the decisions of companies is what's going to accelerate the market. And so the question is like, all kinds of things we can do to help companies make more decisions faster. And I think Carol and Jory mentioned a bunch of really good things. Uh, and to add, uh, a final thing we can add, we can have more good webinars like this one <laughs> we go back to you mercy uh, but it's really isn't that this is a part of it isn't it like just mm. just making sure we have this conversation we help companies make decisions help companies 
get rid of the hassle and move forward. That's done. Fantastic words, Harald. So with those words, I would love to move to the next slide and we will see um, how the audience could access uh, our report in our website. And with uh, that being said, uh, I would like to say again, I thank you Harald, Yuri and Carol and the audience uh, for being with us. And that's it. So thank you very much again and I wish you all a lovely evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.